It's about um, 10, 15, 11, 15. 11, 15. So I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Jay McCoy. I am from um, TGRL, which is the Teaching Research and Learning, which we can all this conference and make sure we work it. Um, so I'm going to be presiding over it. Um, so we can do the introductions. We can start with the bar end. So I'm Margaret Marr, and I'm the director of the literature program in the School of Public Affairs. I'm Joel Lappenrod. I'm a senior at American, and I'm a co-student director for the leadership program. I'm Meg Weeks, and I'm the director of the College of Arts and Sciences Leadership and Ethical Development program. I'm Terrence Tu, and I'm a first-year student at AU, and I'm a part of the CBRS program and the leadership program. I'm Madison Hayes. I'm a junior, and I'm in the honors program. I'm Jane Palmer. I'm the director of the Community-Based Research Scholars Program, and I'm on faculty in SPA. Right. We thought we'd like to know a little bit more about you all as well and what, what draws you to this uh, examination of experiential learning and leadership development. Um, I think we're small enough we can go around in 30 seconds for two or each. Just introduce yourself and, and your connection to the topic. Hi, my name is Leah Jones, and actually I'm not a professor or an adjunct. I'm a student. I'm not a student. Excellent. Welcome. I'm Selena Ryan. I am an MSOD from the School of Public Affairs and Organization Development. I'm an HR trainer here on staff, and I've developed a 10 week leadership development class for staff. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to get a couple more tools, see how you guys are using it in your programs, and make sure that we have some consistency in how we're delivering our work. Cool. I'm Karen Cornfield, uh, graduated with Selena from the NSOD program recently, and um, I work part-time in uh, university marketing here, uh, but the rest of my life I'm doing organization development work and leadership development. Hello, I'm Alison Anderson, I'm a senior at Texas and I actually just started, I'm a grad student here at AU, and I just started working with the community-based research scholars program. <laughs> My name is Lil Donna Smith, uh, and I work with the Jump Start program. I'm a program assistant uh, upstairs, and so we work with uh, children in preschool classrooms, getting our aid and college students to teach them the skills. And I wanted to learn how you all engage um, in experiential learning. See how I can it. I'm Ann LaCure. I teach arts management over in the Katzen Art Center, and my two classes are cultural policy and cultural leadership, and I'm trying to make those two connect get a little closer to the time. I'm Mandy Stewart. I'm a PhD candidate in SPA, and I'm um, within a leadership development program in my undergraduate, so it's an orientation. Um, and I'm also going to be on faculty starting next fall at NC State with one class under my belt. <laughs> Uh, I'm Brian Rowe, uh, Director of Experiential Education and Career Science. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm Jessica Waters from SPA, and I work with the Leaf Program in Sierra House in different capacities, so uh, I'm here to support you. Hello, everyone. My name is Rafi Patel. I'm a junior here at American University, and, uh, and I'm also one of the co student directors in the Leaf Program. I'm Jason Frisch, first year doctoral student in SPA. Um, as a West Point graduate, leaders of development and undergrad is something I'm uh, very interested in learning more about. Mm -hmm. My name is Jason Fabrican. Uh, I work administratively and teach in the School of Professional Extended Studies, uh, SPECS. And as you can tell from the title, many of our programs, if not most of our programs, uh, involve experiential learning. So please, please, right there. Mm -hmm. My name is Heather Zimmerman. I'm a PhD student at Guy Whitney University. My research focuses on resilience and deaf education, and I really want to learn more about experiential learning, developing leadership in learners who um, are marginalized. Um, I'm Olivia Ivey. I'm the public affairs librarian here at American University. I've done some work with the leadership students, the first years in their interest groups uh, work with me, and I'm interested in how students engage with information that they apply in their experiential learning and the ways in which maybe the library can be as involved as we can. Hi everyone, uh, Marlena Reese McKnight. I'm uh, new to AU, I'm with the Center for Diversity and Inclusion. Um, work closely with the STEP program, which is the summer program um, for undergraduate students and thinking about the different ideas um, for experiential learning in that space. 
from us about 10 or 12 minutes for each of the three programs and then we wanted to facilitate a conversation with you all uh, and try to build a community around experiential learning and leadership development. Does that sound like a plan? Great. Great. So um, I get to go first and there's a small PowerPoint that goes along with this. Did you click it? No, they didn't have a clicker. Can you get a click? They don't have a clicker for us. Shall we change seats? Um, I don't know. I can stand up too. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. It's okay. Thank you, Meg. That was very generous. Always. <laughs> That's right. So, um, as I mentioned, I'm the director of the leadership program in the School of Public Affairs um, and have been so for the last six and a half years. I used to teach law to undergraduates, and I think that the biggest shift uh, as an educator in leadership studies for me was a realization that I no longer teach. That is to say, I no longer um, download or transfer knowledge. Instead, what I do is to facilitate learning. Um, and this is because, in my view, leadership development is best uh, acquired through experience. By going out and doing, and then reflecting meaningfully on that experience, adjusting in light of that reflection, and going out and doing again. Do, reflect, and adjust is what uh, we say in the program. And I facilitate the students' learning through careful mentoring and coaching through this process. This necessitates uh, quite an individualized approach. Uh, we try to enable our students to identify and pursue their own passions, their own goals, their own path to success, and then to support them in their pursuit of those. We rely a great deal on uh, peer learning and teaching. We work to create a culture of excellence uh, that encourages our students to aim high. Uh, through this process of carefully examined and mentored experiential learning, Students gain a greater sense of themselves and what they can achieve. They gather skills that are essential to their, um, their future success, including skills as leaders. Welcome. Um, and I enjoy watching their capacity to achieve just expand exponentially. It's really rewarding work. Um, <clears throat> So a little bit about the program. It was uh, founded years ago by President Kerwin when he was the dean of SBA. <laughs> uh, almost uh, 25 years later, our mission remains to provide students with the knowledge, skills, and experience to prepare them for leadership roles in public service. Uh, in the new millennium, the program has taken the form of a four-year certificate program in advanced leadership studies. Students apply uh, the summer before their first year, so after they're admitted to AU. Uh, we admit 42 students and we get applications of more than three times that many. Uh, students who attend, intend to major in SBA are eligible to apply, although by the time they graduate as seniors, we have students from all five schools. Our program has three components, a classroom component, an experiential learning component, and a community building component that includes retreats, outings, meals, alumni outreach, and a wide variety of activities that are all led by our students. In the classroom, we um, uh, strive to deliver a curriculum that supports our students' experiential learning outside the classroom. We study leaders, their causes, leadership theory, leaders' best practices, current events, social movements, and organizational behavior. We examine our personality types, we uh, work on career development, uh, and I would love to be able to spend 15 minutes or so telling you about the curriculum. Unfortunately, um, to get coverage, um, I'm gonna leave that out and today focus in on our experiential learning component. 
of the program. So um, because we've learned that leadership is best learned through experience, in the first and second years, our students design and implement their own social action project, projects. Our juniors secure an internship and take our internship class, which is taught by an adjunct that focuses on organizational behavior. Our students uh, compare the theories of organizational behavior with respect to leadership, power, motivation, group dynamics, diversity, with what they're witnessing in their internship setting and determine whether or not uh, these theories have any explanatory power for what they're experiencing. And our first and second year students, as they develop their um, social action projects, uh, they choose a social problem of concern to them. I don't tell them what they need to study. I don't tell them what they should worry about. They choose it. In the first year, they have to convince six other people that this is the problem that they need to, to explore. In the sophomore year, they get to choose their own problem. Um, <clears throat> after they choose their problem, they research it, sometimes with Olivia Ivey's assistance from the library. Um, they talk to scholars who are studying the problem. They talk to people who are affected by the problem. They find out what others are doing to address that problem, what has been done historically and presently, and with that information, they write a policy memo. First year students are also challenged to actually talk to people who are affected by this problem and <clears throat> write a constituents report. Uh, at the end of the fall semester, uh, they create a project proposal and our sophomores write a grant application. Students get detailed feedback from faculty and the teaching team on all their written work. Their work is evaluated against the standard of how would a supervisor in an internship feel about this work, which is a function of how much more work needs to be done to be able to get this document out the door. This is designed to help prepare them for the professional world. Um, students' project proposals are assessed for their achievability and efficacy. <clears throat> students um, execute these projects in the spring semester. They choose exactly what they want to do about the problem. We don't tell them what to do. It is entirely up to them. They need to find something that's going to be effective and achievable in order to get a good grade on their project proposal. But as long as it's legal, they get to choose what it is that they're going to do. Now, I have had some pro proposals that <laughs> teeter, but um, civil disobedience is not our mission at this point. And then at the end of the spring semester, they write a final report. Half of it describes what they did and to what effect, and the other half assesses what they learned. They're evaluated not by the success or failure of the project, but instead on the accuracy and the thoroughness of their report of what they did and to what effect, and the insight that they bring to what they learned from this. We strive to teach them that it's okay to fail. This is something that's hard for social scientists to learn. It is okay to fail as long as you learn from that failure. That's what leaders do, they learn from failure. In the first year, students work in groups of seven, as I mentioned before, um, sophomores work independently. Um, some of our groups, for example, this year, one of our first year groups was worried about the school to prison pipeline, um, and they have uh, partnered with some boys and girls clubs. They're gonna go in and teach those students about what the DC disciplinary policy is, the zero tolerance policy. They'll find out what the students think about that, how they wanna change it. Um, and then they're going, to part, they're going to create opportunities for them to advocate for what those, those changes are as well as develop advocacy skills to achieve that. Um, another student is concerned about gender roles in Nicaragua uh, and the disempowerment of women. She's identified that athletics is a great empowerment tool and so is going collecting all kinds of soft, uh, soccer balls with empowering slogans that she's going to write on. She's taking them to Nicaragua this spring break and she's going to teach young women how to play soccer. Um, in the past, students have educated younger students in D.C. on leadership, how to and why to apply for college, uh, environmental awareness. They've created mentorship programs. Uh, they've created advocacy and awareness programs from everything from sexual, sexual assault to medical marijuana. They've written books, produced plays, made videos, designed websites, sponsored awareness events and art contests, and conducted original research. It's all up to them. In the journey, um, uh, of choosing this problem and designing and executing a social action project, the students are guided by myself and a student member of the teaching team. Um, they, we found that, that peer learning and teaching is really valuable to leadership development. Each year, our first year project group is, uh, has a teaching assistant who is a sophomore in the program who just went through the experience the year before. They meet with them outside of the class weekly. 
Sophomores are guided, our sophomores are guided one-on-one -on -one by a senior in the program who went through the experience two years before. They meet with them weekly to offer them guidance, to monitor their progress, and offer them in that all-important encouragement. We have two alumni assistants, uh, recent graduates of the program, who assist me in offering detailed feedback on the students' work as well as help in implementing the curriculum. I meet weekly with each of the teaching teams uh, for about two hours apiece, and together we design the curriculum, lesson plans, critique our work, and develop plans to guide our students' progress. Reflection is a key component to all this, as I mentioned. Uh, to this do, adjust, reflect, and adjust process to aid our students in that process. In the first four semesters, they write um, weekly journal entries. I use these to help monitor and guide our students through their work on their projects and more generally through their leadership development and their journey through college. At the end of the first two semesters, our students read a classical work about teamwork, the developmental sequence of small groups. You may have heard of forming, storming, norming, and performing, and they re uh, evaluate that against what they've experienced in their first semester in, the, in their uh, team. And then in, the in this winter, they read five dysfunctions of a team and evaluate that as whether it has any explanatory period for what they went through. Uh, we also go through strength-based leadership when we evaluate whether or not the group has made use of their strength-based uh, skills. They compare, um, uh, and then um, in addition to all that, I take a walk and talk with each of my students, uh, the fall with the first year students and the spring with the second year students. Our students go on to um, considerable success in securing internships, merit awards, commencements awards, graduate and professional school admissions, and rewarding careers. For example, from 2011 through this summer, we have 13 leadership students who will have interned in the Obama White House. Uh, in the past five years, we've had nine nominated for a Truman Scholarship, six who became finalists, and two who won, among other nationwide scholarships. Our students find that they can point to what they've done in the, and accomplished in the leadership program as indicative of their capacity to achieve, as well as their desire to make a difference and their leadership and teamwork skills. Um, so as we knew from introductions, we have two students with us, both uh, Joelle Appenrod and Rahi Patel, who are student directors. We have time to hear from, from Joelle for a couple of minutes, and they'll both be here for the question and answer and discussion session. Joelle, take it away. Great, thank you, Professor Mark. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm in my final year of undergrad at AU, and I've learned it genuinely every step of the way during my time at American. What I've learned the, bo the most about myself, about others, and about the world is the leadership program. When I was sitting at New Student Orientation listening to the leadership presentation, an alumnus of ours said, I wouldn't be the person I am today without all the experiences I've had in the leadership program. And I remember thinking, I don't buy it, he's exaggerating. And now, two and a half years later, I know exactly what he's talking about. The learning process really does transcend classroom walls in the leadership program, but it's not a coincidence that the lessons we learn in the classroom transcend these classroom walls. The program really does prepare students for leadership roles in public service and in life. To do so, we spend time studying the hard and soft skills of leadership, leadership theory, and social change. As they say, lessons are only as valuable as the experience they are rooted in. We learn in the classroom how to affect social change. Then we go out and attempt to affect social change, and the lessons we learn in the classroom are being enhanced, either while we're doing it or after we're doing it and then reflecting. The process of doing, reflecting, and adjusting, as Professor R mentioned, takes the lesson in the classroom to the next level. We can study the theory of emotional intelligence all we want, but it's not until we're in a situation where our emotional intelligence either falters or flourishes that we can truly understand the importance of it to being an effective leader. While all leadership students have heard Professor Mar ask, what can we learn from this, more times than we can count, and we don't always appreciate the question in the moment, it conditions us to really be lifelong learners. As funny as it sounds, we're taught to learn. We're given learning objectives, high expectations, and mentoring from Professor Marr and the teaching assistants, but ultimately we create the route to achieving our learning objectives. When people ask about the culture of American, the closest I've come to be able to explain it is every student really cares about something. And as you all know, it's not unusual to hear AU students discussing, discussing these social issues that they really care about. 
but there are far few students who are actually acting on that care. I think students who are engaged in experiential learning are fortunate in that they are given resources to act on their care. And the action leads to a cycle of learning that may start and end in the classroom, but moves far beyond a textbook, a paper, or a conversation between the times in the classroom. And it's the time in between that makes the classroom learning very, very rewarding. All right, thank you. So I think um, that's the leadership program in a nutshell, and we'll hand it over to Jane for an explanation of the community-based research scholars. Sure. And hello. Yep. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm actually going to talk about two things, um, but they're uh, they're interrelated. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm the director of the community-based research scholars program. Uh, it's a brand new program. It's our inaugural year, and um, the this program teaches undergrad students, first-year students, um, how to conduct social science research in collaboration with a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, and part of that is community-based learning. So in the fall they do community-based learning and in the spring they do community-based research. So the other program that uh, Madison, Terrence gonna, is gonna speak to CDRS. Madison's gonna speak to community-based learning. Um, I taught a class this fall um, that had a community-based learning component and I don't know if you know about it, we won't go into too much detail, but um, students have to do a minimum of 20 hours with a nonprofit as part of the academic uh, requirements of the course and um, what they're doing in the community is integrated into the academics of the course. So the course is called Social Construction of Childhood. It was about how public policies and inequalities affect children's experience of childhood. So I had four organizations that were child related and Madison will speak to that. And community-based research scholars, we have 30 scholars that um, are in a living learning community and we're working with a United Planning Organization um, to conduct a community needs assessment with them in all eight wards uh, this spring. So I'm going to turn it over to Madison to talk about her experience with CDL this fall. Okay, so um, as Professor Palmer said, I was in her community-based learning class this past fall, and my site was Safe Shores, also known as the DC Child Advocacy Center. Um, and at the time, I picked it because it sounded I like little kids, and I was just going to do my 20 hours, and um, be do the requirement. Um, but it, I had no idea that it would turn into um, so much more and I'm um, planning to continue and I'm excited to continue working with them um, this spring. Um, so uh, DC Child Advocacy Center is designed to handle um, child abuse cases of all kinds, so that includes sexual abuse. Um, and what happens is that when child abuse is reported, um, there are so many different agencies that have to be involved, from law enforcement to medical examiners to social workers to child psychologists. Um, and the idea is that having all of those agencies in one center um, minimizes the trauma for the child. So they only have to do one forensic interview. Everyone, um, all of representatives from all those different agencies are there listening to the interview. Um, and it's designed to make the family more comfortable with the process. So um, my main job was really to do just that. I would um, spend time with the kids while they were waiting for their interviews. They have playrooms and snacks and books and games. Um, so that was like the, the more hands-on part of the job of like that was, I would go in for my three hour shift and more, almost every single time there was a family there. Um, and so I would spend time with the kids, um, direct the parents if they were there to any resources that they needed um, and also give some tours of the center so that they felt comfortable with the process. Um, and then when there was downtime, I also did some uh, ordering of uh, different materials that families might need. They take in a lot of donations, so I'd organize those. Um, they give every family anything, clothes, food, um, toiletries, anything that they might need if they're in transition. Um, but besides that, there are what m my classmates and I found was um, the best part of working at Safe Shores was that there was a lot of room to kind of leave our mark and um, take on a little bit more of a leadership role. They kind of gave us a lot of leeway in how we wanted to spend our time there. So when there was downtime, we decided to make a resource guide for um, families. A lot of times they it's a very uncomfortable situation. They don't know where to turn. They there's other problems going on in their lives that they might need, um, you know, a safe uh, someone to watch their child when they're at work and working two jobs and things like that, and they don't know where to turn. So we made um, a very organized resource guide 
of um, different educational opportunities so that parents could get their GED, um, shelter, everything that you could possibly imagine. Um, so that was uh, the mark that we decided to make. And then um, they also had an opportunity on a random Tuesday night to go to this um, training called Stewards of Children. Um, it was a uh, child uh, sexual abuse prevention training. And um, two of my classmates and I went to the training. Um, and after that, we're so interested in it, we decided to become certified and become facilitators. So we are now trained facilitators in the uh, Stewards of Children training through Darkness to Light. And we're hoping to bring that to AU. We did a small um, kind of uh, test training for some members of the Wellness Center and a few students. And then just this past Wednesday, um, I went to a charter school and ran a training. Um, so the idea is that we can take the message from um, Safe Shores and push it out to the community a little bit more. And I had no idea that I would end up doing that when I started working there. Um, but now it's really, um, as Joelle said, it's kind of become this um, cyclical relationship in that we learned some things in class, but you can't learn um, about how resilient child children are, how much these issues impact families unless you're actually working with them. Um, so we learned some in class, um, some at the site, and then now we have this opportunity to, um, to continue this work further. Um, hello, my name is Terrence Tu, and I'm a first year student at AU. And today I will tell you about my experiences with the community based research program um, during my first semester of college. And um, in this program, students learn how to work together with the, with the community, and we learn the appropriate methods of um, creating successful partnerships with organizations in the community and uh, interacting with members of the community in order to. Um, effectively help the community in need. And we learn many valuable things in the classroom, but the learning benefits extend far beyond a, a traditional classroom setting. Uh, this semester, we partner with the United Planning Organization, which is uh, a, an organization that is responsible for allocating and distributing funds to other local organizations that um, help the poor in the city. And and we worked together with them in order to create a historical archive for them because they didn't have one. And to do this, we interview key figures who were instrumental during the 1960s who were very, um, who played a huge role in helping the group develop and impact the community. And so by doing this, we were able to get hands-on experience on conducting oral histories and transcribing interviews. And that is so much valuable because it is more than, and it's so much more valuable than reading textbooks on how to do oral histories. And at first, um, I was part of the, the oral histories and transcribing um, interviews just as a project, but I, by, through this experience, I realized that it is really important to document the histories and uh, document stories of other people. And that inspired me to take on my own personal independent project of um, documenting the stories of Korean refugees. Um, they are, um, uh, I'm a Korean ethnic and they're from Myanmar. And so I am, I'm not sure how to begin the project yet, but I have a good idea that um, I will begin by documenting the stories of Korean refugees who are living in the refugee camps and who are already in the United States. And in addition, um, this semester, we, the the Kermit based uh, research program will be working together with UPO again to um, conduct a community needs assessment. And we will be going out in the community and we'll be interviewing people um, in all over the A words. And that is really, really valuable because we get to help the community um, who is in need, but at the same time, um, as students, we also get to apply the knowledge and the skills we learn inside the classroom in a real work setting. And so I'm really excited for it, I'm really looking forward to it. But um, the takeaway point from what I have to say is that the incorporation of experiential learning in the CBRS program is really helpful for the students because we don't just learn valuable information and store them in our brains. We actually apply what we learn in a professional um, setting, in a, in a real 
um, setting, and, and that is really important because it is integral for our growth and development as individuals and as college students. Thank you, Terrence and Madison. So, as you can see, there are a lot of different ways that we're that we're trying to get students outside of the classroom and um, and into the DC community. You know, DC we like to joke is in Upper Caucasia, and students that don't leave this general area don't really see the rest of DC. So, how can we create opportunities for students to see DC? And um, I'm a former social worker, so this was just natural to me when I came to AU that like we work with nonprofits and we see how we can partner. And when I was the director of nonprofit. I would have loved to have Madison and Terrence working for me because that is such a valuable way. The community university partnerships are valuable on both ends. Thank you. Um, it's been wonderful hearing from my colleagues. Um, I am Meg Weeks, and one of the things I've done in my years at AU is serve perhaps one of my favorite jobs for this one as Associate Dean for Academics for the Washington Semester Program, which is AU's um, experiential education program. And so I've spent quite a bit of time seeing the value of experiential education and also seeing ways in which, if not done right, although it is done right obviously in these programs, students don't get the academic support they need along with the experience they're getting. And I wanted to make sure that our students get both. And that's what I worked with at Washington Semester. A lot of what's been said here, we're doing, although not the um, social science research, and I can provide copies of my syllabi to anybody who's interested, just let me know, I will send them out. But in the interest of time, I will talk about what we try to do when we set up this program and what we've done this first semester, which has basically become what Kant would call a prolegomena, or a foundation for any future leadership studies in the College of Arts and Sciences. Dean Peter Starr of the College of Arts and Sciences wanted to set up a leadership and ethical development program, and we did so this fall, so this is a work very much in progress. We wanted to encourage the development of leadership and ethical knowledge in all our students from every single discipline. And Peter really cared that students be able to bring what they were learning in their disciplines and the multiplicity <coughs> of ways in which people might lead in a lab or in an economics forum to leadership and he wanted them to learn how to recognize leadership and how to identify ethical conundrums that perhaps nobody else was recognized. It is premised on the belief that to become a leader, you must first become a human being. And that goes back to Confucius in the sixth century BC. And it also is based upon the very valuable insight of George Santayana, a philosopher from the um, turn of the 20th century who said the great difficulty of education is to get experience out of ideas and at the same time to get ideas from experience. So we are consciously and ever mindful of that knife edge that we walk with this. The program is a four-year, 21-credit certificate program with 12 credits in the program itself and nine credits in each student's field, picked with consultation with me and with each student's program director in his or her discipline. There are 14 academic disciplines re represented right now, although as you know, as students and working with students, those are changing at all times. Um, we look at leadership and ethical development in each discipline and um, as well as in a variety of the professional settings that the students hope to go to. To do this, we have used dialogue and its practice as the heart of the first two years of this program. With the plan that the students will put on a leadership and ethical development symposium, going back to Plato's idea of the symposium from his dialogues at the end of their second year for the campus. Humans learn through dialogue. Intentional, mindful practice of it. As you're reading a text, as you're talking to people around the kitchen table, as you're sitting in your residence hall, as you're on a forum, as you're looking back and forth at people in a classroom, you are constantly engaged in dialogue. And we know that people best make progress by practicing effective dialogue. 
none of my students are here today to talk about this. Rather, we would like to invite you to visit with us during the semester, either on Wednesday evenings in McKinley 113 at 530, or at any other time throughout the semester that you are available. We'd like to remain in dialogue with you. We started um, in the first year with wanting our students to understand and become conscious of their own authority and ethical decisions at this time, and the fact that they are already leaders in their own rights over themselves and are having effects on others. We wanted to really focus on the fact that not only did they come to us as leaders based upon our sorting through the applications and based upon the leadership experience they brought to the table, but they're already making a significant difference as leaders in their own lives and having ethical effects. While requiring traditional texts and papers in class meetings, this program is designed largely as practical experiential education through the setup of our classes. We've encouraged students to take responsibility for their own learning, re reading and exploring beyond what is assigned, and coming up with the questions for class and for themselves and for the communities in which they are involved. We emphasize constant questioning and probing, encouraging the students to learn by exploration. We recognize that the unexpected will come up as it did regularly, and that leadership needs and ethical problems and opportunities are everywhere and require our constant dedication and involvement. I used Chris Argyris' Teaching Smart People How to Learn and Peter Sandy's The Fifth Discipline as I was um, designing the class. I also used a handout that I gave you um, just on um, experiential learning versus a traditional classroom. I've been unable to find an attribution for that, but it comes from an earlier um, Farron conference, so if anybody knows, please email me. Argyris' main point, and he's a professor at Harvard, is that most people don't know how to learn. They know how to jump through hoops. They know how to solve the problems put um, in front of them in a, a formal way, but they're not very good at looking beyond the formal um, checkoffs that they need to do to focus, on, to focus on making mistakes, exploring further. They don't look as closely as they should at their own internal response to problems. They tend to look at external things to get solutions. So they're good at linear thinking, but they're not so good at what um, our jurist calls double loop or systems learning, reflecting on how they think reflecting on um, the cognitive rules they use to design and implement their actions. They're not so good at reflecting on interrelationships of multiple parts of a problem. They fear failure, even small errors, as we all do. They, along with most of us, have not practiced how to operate when afraid, how to ask questions, how to be wrong, how to reason from your behavior, make multiple mistakes, and continue on. So this is something we have practiced all semester very mindfully in class, and we will continue to do so. We focused in class on dialogue, practicing and practicing. We've studied listening. That is, following the disturbances we feel when we're engaged in discussion, mm -hmm. noting the resistance we have to certain things, sitting and thinking mindfully, before responding with a new major answer. We practice respecting, treating the person next to us, even if it's someone we view as an enemy, as our greatest teacher, trying to recognize the humanity in all of us. We practice suspending judgment, thinking about why we think the way we do, why we choose the categories we, we have chosen, why we tend to snap to a judgment, and we've also worked on finding <coughs> voices, not what we've heard from our parents or our communities, but what we genuinely hear where we are. We work to help the students do this, and we practice it in every class and wherever we are. In many ways, this was a very <coughs> different class from what I had planned, because we had students who were not ready for this. It became clear in the first two weeks that a sizable number of the students, many of whom were first-gen college students, were only at AU and had only done um, 
the application and had only done the leadership um, and um, programs that led them to be accepted to our program. So they could check off yet another box toward the piece of paper that would lead them to a good job. They thought that the process itself of being here for four years was probably worthless and a waste of money, but it was the only way they could figure out to get from here to a good job. So this led to an unexpected um, detour so that we could explore the opportunities at AU and higher education more broadly with an open mind, recognizing we might find they weren't valuable, and practice more mindfully dialogue. Because out of that discussion the first two weeks as we were getting to know each other, we had quite a bit of controversy, as you might imagine, from the people who jumped in and said, oh no, this is very valuable. Think of what we can get. And instead of speaking mindfully to each other, it became, shall I say, testy. So we proceeded to start <coughs> studying first why we might be here and what might be the reason for a college um, education. We practiced being mindful, being intentional, overcoming fear and ignorance, and taking responsibility for our learning. The small group dialogues I had planned for the second half of our class <coughs> session every week quickly became something that would have to start in second semester because we needed more work as a group building community. So this semester quickly became a time for building the practical skills we needed to advance in leadership and ethical development. The second weekend, we went to William Penn House for retreat on Capitol Hill using the Quaker Work Camp model. They have projects throughout the world as well as in Northeast and Anacostia. I chose this model for the early weeks of the class so we could practice mindful dialogue and reflective inquiry as we built community and to help the students get down off this city on the hill that is AU to a wider community. While emphasizing that I had not selected this model for any religious or evangelical purposes, I noted that the Quakers had been skilled for centuries at dialogue and reflective inquiry and at working with community through dialogue and meeting before making decisions and that they view all human beings as valuable, they would say sacred, but that every human being has worth. And that we can only move forward by depending on every one of us, that we must struggle to recognize and restore the humanity of us all by working in relationship with each other as we work to lead and transform. These were critical lessons, and I can go into what we did with the work camps and who's still involved and what other people have um, gone on if you have questions about that. Meanwhile, in class, we further explored what it means to be a responsible human being and leader and how it must not be beyond anyone and how having the right credentials and being in position of leadership is not what being a leadership leader is. The unexpected questioning of the value of higher education actually turned into one of the high points of the class because as each member of the class did research, reflected, engaged in dialogue, fought with their earlier um, assumptions, <coughs> and worked with others in the class, we came to a community. As we practiced these issues, we worked with the practices of um, Isaacs and Bohm, and Bohm is a physicist, which thrilled the scientists in the class, uh, and half the class is in biology, chemistry, and other pre-med disciplines. So that made them very happy that this had some hard stuff behind it. Um, so our semester was a focus on dialogue and whether it was worth it to find a commitment beyond the piece of paper that many of our students um, thought was the goal. This practice of dialogue will, I hope, lead the students this spring semester or early in the fall of 2015 to begin to be ready to take part in dialogue across the campus. During the coming semester, we're going to explore and practice rural cafes and simple conversations to restore hope for the future following the teachings of Meg Wheatley and Juanita Brown. While practicing dialogue, we shared narratives as a ground of our program so that we have a shared group of stories to build on. 
We started with um, Endurance, which they read over the summer, to provide a good introduction to fear that's beyond anything they could imagine from the situations they were in, and facing it, while also being a riveting story of a man who stepped into a leadership role beyond any he had imagined. We also read Melville's Billy Budd, so we could look at evil, and um, the ways to face it and handle it. Death of a Salesman, to focus on their own lives that they have to live, which caused problems because um, many of them came up and said, well, I'm not gonna read that because I'm never going to be a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, it was written in before 1950, so it's old. Um, they hadn't realized Melville had written a long time before, but the copies of A Death of a Salesman were old, and that just, so we had to have a discussion about um, the world of um, making your life. Um, and as a result, I gave him a copy of Clay Christensen's How Will You um, Live Your Life? He's a Harvard Business School dean and professor who talked about ways to value your life and how important it is to provide balance. And that turned out to be a very good discussion once we got through the angst about being a salesman um, and why salesmen are human beings too. We read The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison to discuss um, failures to recognize the ethical challenges that are right in front of us and um, talk about ways to start training ourselves um, to look beyond the expectations of society, to speak up over um, evil and to see um, the humanity of all. And we read Things Fall Apart to look at change and the opportunities and risks it brings to all of us, especially leaders. Interestingly, out of Things Fall Apart, one of our students, and each of them is doing a separate um, leadership quest this semester, has begun working with his Jirai Martin Art community in the Carolinas, and he's only been here um, in this country a few years, having just come over from Vietnam, helping develop a um, dictionary glossary and work on the history of his family and his particular group of Martin Art people. Um, and that book really resonated for him. We supplemented these with handouts from Socratic Dialogues, and I'm talking about what Socratic Dialogue is, so they had another view. Christensen, Drucker on Managing Yourself, um, and Goldman on Emotional Intelligence and Leadership, which was very important because so many of them had been so hurt at first and had leveled barbs at each other over the discussion about higher education. Each of these supplemental art articles was short enough to read as a support for the narratives we were discussing in dialogue and to help engage as a springboard. As an assessment thus far, we are building community, something I thought might not be possible at one point during the second week of the semester. The students are starting to see the uses of dialogue for leadership and ethical reasoning, both in our class and um, in the communities in which they are working. And they're starting to see how to use dialogue to tease out greater meaning and deeper ideas than they had at first realized were possible. They are learning that fear is okay, and they are excited about moving forward if the notes from them over the holiday break are any indication. There are many paths to leadership. Here's what ours is right now, but we welcome your input based upon your observations, studies, and practices. And now we look forward to a dialogue with you. Thank you. Yay. So to facilitate that dialogue, please, <laughs> what questions do you have, what suggestions, experiences, what has this evoked in you? Um, I have a question for you, uh, Margaret. Mm -hmm. um, you said you use strengths-based. Mm -hmm. Do you use strength quest the assessment to, as your launch? So strengths-based leadership, the book comes with a, an assessment tool. So you have to buy the book new, and uh, and Gallup? and that's yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the students take that assessment. They learn what their strengths are from it, and then um, so that's the end towards the end of the first year. And they use that to talk about in their project groups. Have we made good use of our uh, talents, or where did we? How did we do that? How did we not? Um, some would have us do that at the beginning. My experience is that if you do that at the beginning, they don't really learn the net lesson. If they can look at it in retrospect, 
um, saying, ah, well, we got this right, we got that right, and we really missed the mark here, then they can take that lesson into them, the next teams that they're working in and, and emphasize the use of strengths even if they don't have the strength quest by just asking, what are you good at? Yeah? Okay, follow-up mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, team performance or team development, storming, forming, performing, mm -hmm. storming. Mm -hmm. Do you consider uh, it Tuckman's mm -hmm. work from 1985? Yes, that's what the students read. Okay. One more question yeah. for uh, Meg. Sorry to dominate. Um, you said our en enemy can be our greatest teacher, and you mm -hmm. talked about that in part of your dialogue. Do you deal with the notions of conflict and competition? Yes, we do. You do? Yes. Is that something I might be able to look into in, from your syllabus later? Yeah. Thanks so, so much. Mm -hmm. Meg, is the sign-in going around? Mm -hmm. I, I assume it is. I assume yeah, it's, it's, has everybody it's signed it? Amen. And you're Selena. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and Meg Wheatley, the, um, she's going to be the keynote speaker for the Organization Development Network Conference coming up in Portland in October. So mm -hmm. that's really exciting that mm -hmm. our works are crossing. That's side. great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad she's doing that because I'm upset that the Burkana Institute is on, you know, hiatus right now. So I'm glad she's doing well, that. Well, she hasn't actually signed a contract. So we're trying to get her into it. <laughs> <laughs> we're working on her. You're using it this way. That's not good. Okay. <laughs> we're working. I understand. She's been invited. Yeah. Okay. Jessica. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in this concept of teaching students how to fail. Because mm -hmm. um, I think it's hard for all of us, and I think it's particularly hard for some of our students. I worry that we give really mixed messages, right? Because the message we give to our incoming students is like, you can have 17 internships and study abroad six times and 10 majors and you can do all well and don't worry if you don't sleep. And, you know, and so I'm wondering um, if you have tips on how we, we combat that, right? Because part of our recruiting is you can do all of these things all the time. Um, and, and it doesn't leave room for failure, right? Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, maybe from the student point of view, you know, how, do we, how do we get at that? How do we teach students outside of these programs where you're learning these lessons? How do we bring that to the regular classroom? Um, uh, it's okay to fail and, and how you get back up and do it. It's something I wrestle with because I think we're failing at teaching them how to fail yeah, in agree. the wider community. I agree. So I think that there's a bunch of questions that are wrapped up into that. Um, part of it is uh, resilience, part of it is learning to fail, and a big part of it is competition. And, uh, and, and failing in the face of this competition yeah. that you have created for yourself. Um, and it's something that uh, Joelle and Rahi and I talked about in preparation for this uh, uh, conference, um, is how to create a culture of excellence in which, um, in which you create your own competition as opposed to competing against each other, and a culture of ex excellence in which it's okay to fail. And it's uh, it is tricky business. I'm going to uh, give you folks an opportunity to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, another way that I would explain the culture of AU, although never to a prospective student, mm -hmm. is competitive. Um, and I think that one thing that takes the edge off of that competition is community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why experiential learning is so important because students build community through experiential learning, and they feel as though they belong, and they feel as though their worth is not rooted in where they intern or um, their professional development or achievements. Mm -hmm. Rai, did you want to add to that? Um, I would just want to emphasize what Joel said about community. Um, and I think there's value in working with your peers on this project and as a sophomore, when you're doing the project individually, it's hard to have that individual check that, you know, like, this is my project, I have to see it through, it needs to be stellar, I need to win awards, I need to get it to the place that it needs to be. Whereas when you're working with six other people, you're seeing the actual value that you're implementing in the community, um, and it's not so much, it doesn't feel like a personal failure. It, it's a very much a group effort, a collective effort. So I think that one of the things that best teaches how to fail is to fail. Mm -hmm. And um, and then to have support underneath you when you fall. Um, and how and so part of it is teaching students how to build that support network. And so some of the stuff that we talk about in sophomore classes how is self-care, which is very difficult to teach and harder to do. 
um, and hard to enforce, but that's part of what our seniors TAs are supposed to be doing is checking in on how students are doing on self-care on a weekly basis. What did you do to take care of yourself this week? Um, and also there to support them um, when they fail and hopefully they do fail at some point along the way uh, and then how to become resilient and to adjust to those obstacles that they inevitably encounter. So that's um, having high expectations and being okay with failure are two things that are difficult to align together but I think that that's as you all pointed out, experience is, is essential to that. It's the best educator. But we can do that, but I really do think, the, and we're all, I think we're doing it in our programs, but I think the wider community is not supporting it because they're getting a very different message outside of these protected areas. So this is, I think, one of my questions is the scalability of all this. So you're working with 30 students. In CBRS. Yes. And CBL is much bigger. And you're working with 42 students. And I'm working with 130 mm -hmm. students. It's a bit small. And so you are sort of creating these wonderful, amazing spaces for some students. So what do we do as an AU community to make these kinds of experiences available more broadly so that the broader culture starts to adapt this idea of, of failure as an acceptable or uh, learning tool and not just that you know, these 42 students who come in with leadership program have that community that they've built in which it's safe for them to fail, but every other SPA student that didn't make it into that program buys into the larger cultural aspects that stay in contact. And excuse me, can I just jump on the question? Because my question is also about the scalability, but we're talking here about community, but here we're just talking about students. I mean, when I think about leadership role modeling, Extraordinarily important, and there's learning that can go on among faculty and staff and other adults too. So, mm -hmm. so, so if, um, I think that because of the need to build a community, you have to have a multitude of smaller programs. Yeah. And uh, I think that part of what AU is missing is an oversight of all of those smaller programs. This last year we had lots of small programs for first year students come in. And although I have 42 entering students, I actually have 130 students across four years. Um, and so I'm imagining that you could have a lot of different focuses for these kinds of leadership development programs um, um, in a wide variety of contexts and you know one and and but they would each have to be small have its own autonomy and fit into a larger development a larger organization but it, I think the culture shift has to come not just from these small niche programs but overall and maybe Brian can talk a little bit about that too because Brian's overseeing all those um, internships for credit mm -hmm. but it's also the time in which we live yeah. students come in when I went to college I don't know, I'm going to graduate, get a couple of dogs and travel across the country and all will be well. And I have, I have, I have students come in from before their first day. Well, I need to know what, I'm going to go to law school. I, I need to know what I'm going to do. Well, chill out, just relax. It's going to be okay. I'll yeah, I think I've, I've, um, I've seen that as well as sort of college being a means to an end because grad school is, is yeah. maybe what a BA used to be, right? Yeah. And so... You know, I had students talking to me in September of their first yeah. year about their grad school applications and their transcripts and what they're, what's going to look like for their grad school applications, and I had the same reaction. I mean, of course, you, know, if you can't sit there and be like, well, in my day, because they don't, this is a different day. And so it's about adapting as a, as a faculty member, but also talking about self-care, talking about enjo like enjoying the present, talking about sort of building community and what that will mean for your long-term success, right? And that that this is not just not just a means to an end. Mm -hmm. So we only have a couple more minutes. So sure, I just have. Um, it seems to me that a really productive thing to do in some future session, in some mode, is to do a giant cross reference of all the materials, all the questions, all the methods, all the you know. Because clear, uh, uh, from my perspective, I'm hearing languages, methods, research, um, questions that are directly relevant to the courses that I'm teaching. And mm -hmm. so it would be helpful for me to triangulate all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the one thought that occurred to me as we were talking about how to influence larger authorizing systems about this kind of work 
is the degree to which we can get those languages reflected <coughs> externally. You know, it's so, um, I'm working with an artist right now who does deep experiential <coughs> engagement work with um, the incarceration system. And the thing that he has the hardest thing doing is representing the actual effects of the engagement and the level of detail and complexity that they exist inside those systems. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out how to represent the work of this kind of leadership to an authorizing environment that may or may not speak those languages, may or may not share those values, seems somewhere on the long list of things that we all do. Yeah. All right. all right. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.